awesome to have you, buddy. Thanks, man. Um, We'll get back into the parasympathetic and stuff like that, but I really wanted to start off the podcast talking about a float. And, you know, we, I think, not we, but myself, I know I've had a lot of study and alternative healing medicine and the general layperson, general listener probably might not even know what a float is. So that's what I want to kind of pick your brain on. First of all, like when you're going for a float, what's the experience that you're going to get? Uh, so yeah, we, we've got um, three separate rooms. Each one has got a float tank and a shower and towels and all the stuff you need. And the tank itself is about seven feet long, six feet wide. And um, there's 10 inches of water inside with 1,100 pounds of Epsom salt. Mm-hmm. So it's so dense. The water so dense that you just float on the surface. 1,100? Huh? I remember yeah. hearing like 800, but that's even more. Yeah, 800 is in the old style tanks. There's, there's some the older style Samadhi tanks. They're a little smaller. Like we hold a bigger volume of water, so we need to to add more salt yeah it's a mountain of salt man like when we first the first time we, we put the salt in i thought there's no way it's going to dissolve but you just keep running the filter and, and it goes but yeah so our job essentially is to remove as much external stimulation um physically as possible so like mm-hmm. the rooms are soundproof and uh you know you got earplugs in to keep the salt out of your ears and inside the tank there's a light button and a music button and so once you get in there and get comfortable you can put a neck pillow behind your your head if you want mm-hmm. um and then you can shut the lights and the music off. And if you do, there's just nothing. No light, no sound. And you kind of lose sensation in the water after a while. And because you're being suspended and there's no pressure points anywhere, your body starts to lose sensation of gravity. And it's, it's neat. Like you can feel like you're spinning. That's a, almost everybody gets out. At first, um, they say when they first got in, they felt like they were just spinning around and around and just waiting for their head to hit, but it never does. Mm-hmm. I think you're just looking for that, you know, equilibrium kind of thing. I sometimes get the sensation that I'm like floating up. It's, it's neat. So you, all that, um, your, your body's constantly sending signals back to your nervous system um, to tell you your position in space. Even when you're sitting here, like there's muscles, your posture muscles are firing and telling mm-hmm. you where you're, where you're at, you know. Um, so there's just a constant kind of muscular hum coming into your nervous system when you're navigating gravity and, and your environment. But once you're lying in there for a while, all that stuff kind of dies down. If you let it, you got to you gotta just kind of... Mm-hmm. There's an art go. to that, eh? Yeah. Let go. Totally, yeah. totally. And then so it's kind of like, you know, the analogy I've heard used is uh, you're kind of just all that um, kind of ram in your brain that's being used up by that, that muscular noise mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. kind of die away and, and you can really tune in um, internally. So I noticed that... The, the best way to kind of get into it is just to focus on getting your breath easy. Mm-hmm. And so if everything, uh, what I tell people every time is uh, your neck is going to feel like you don't know where to put it. So mm-hmm. you got to just kind of relax your shoulders, relax your head, and just let your head float without effort because your brain wants to kind of fight it. Now, yes. Because it's not used to doing that. Yeah. So that's why we have that neck pillow. If, if, uh, and it's, it works awesome because it's just skinny. It doesn't prop your head up at all. But then once you're comfortable, then it's the same thing with your body. Like your body's still kind of fighting. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So if you could just really pay attention and uh i always like bringing it back to yoga you know like the, the shavasana pose at the mm-hmm. end it, like it's the same thing you just i like to do that scan get your breath nice and easy see if you can do like four second inhale and eight second exhale kind of thing mm-hmm. and um you start to feel if you have any chronic pain it usually kind of comes up and you'll you become really aware of that but you got to just kind of kind of let it go and once that starts to happen you start to hear your heartbeat which is awesome like mm-hmm. it, for me when the water's just still and I can feel my heartbeat, I almost kind of feel it in the water and I just kind of, like it takes me away. It's, it's kind of mm-hmm. rhythmic, you know what I mean? But I mean, that said, if you want, you can keep your lights and your music on. Like it's totally, there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's, it's just whatever helps people relax. And it's kind of just the intention of giving yourself a 90 minute chunk of time for just nothing, nothing mm-hmm. to happen, you know? And um, the most common feedback we get is the first you know, first 10, 20 minutes, people get in there and it's, they kind of get over the novelty of it and they think, oh man, what am I going to do here for 90 minutes, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just, they just kind of get in their breath and then it just kind of goes, like your, your, your perception of time kind of changes. And mm-hmm. uh, like for me, by the end, like the, I don't know how, how long it is or, or at what point it happens, but it's just like every breath just feels incredible. You know, mm-hmm. it's just, it, yeah, it just, there's nothing, nothing going on. And, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty profound. It's hard. People, that's my favorite part. People come out and they're trying to describe like what they felt. Well, that's what I'm just curious to ask you because I know my experience. So yeah. you have more experience yourself dealing with, because I'm sure the people all come out, right? And chat yeah. with you, right? Oh, Which yeah. I think is so cool. Awesome, so yeah. you must get this wide variation of people who are like, yeah. you know, I fell asleep to I saw things to yeah. I felt like I was upside down to yeah. I got peaceful rest, you know? Like yeah. what, like I'm sure you, what were your testimonies like? Oh yeah, all, all that stuff. Like, 
yeah, so people just they fall asleep instantly. So, like we've had people come out and they just like stuff welled up in, inside them like it, it, cathartically. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, like stuff mm-hmm. comes up that they just yeah that, that they've been carrying around for a while and just feel like you can just kind of let it go. Like there's something there's something so connected to our our physical state. You know what I mean? Like when you're when you're holding on, and and if you just give yourself time to to let go and and that seems to be the best way to kind of guide people there is to have them focus on the physical like your your body knows how to let go mm-hmm. you just got to get out of the way like that's the that's mm-hmm. the biggest thing and, and even myself whenever i get in there because there's always a million things i could be doing in the shop or, you know, like there's a million things to do always so the f- the first bit is just telling myself like this is exactly what you're supposed to be doing you know what i mean yeah, yeah. no i just heard yeah. that on a quote on instagram like i've just been following a lot of like just kind of mindfulness pages yeah. meditation pages and this one quote really just was so simple and it struck me really profound it's like why do we not allow ourselves to just relax yeah. calm down yeah, like there's really in this moment there's nothing harmful going on totally. there's nothing to stress about we got clothes food everything yeah and just eat myself i do meditation frequently yeah. you know i floated it and i've done all that and it's just like it takes about a good 15 minutes yeah. to kind of really go I, even in meditation my shoulders are hiked up to my yeah. ears and i go holy man like i gotta go yeah like, ah, let yeah. them drop down yeah. it's so weird that body tension that we just carry like totally. i wonder where that's from almost you know what i mean there's that constant stress or stimuli i don't yeah. know what that is but it's just always there almost yeah and we seem to kind of undervalue it as a society like undervalue mm-hmm. just rest you know what i mean and, yes and it, it seems it's uh it's strange like that kind of glorification of busy you know like where yeah people almost feel guilty if they're not busy doing something you know yeah and then even when you're doing something like you're kind of rushing through what you're doing to get to the next thing like you're you're not just doing the one thing you're doing Uh it's it's a i mean i catch myself all the time um it's uh yeah it's gotten more and more interesting i I don't i just heard a cool thing about it too i don't know where it started it happened with i can't remember which exact religion did it it was something in catholicism but they they attribute moral value to actions a lot of like say your work like you were doing right. good work yeah, you know yeah. what i mean you're doing bad you're you know oh, i'm bad i stuck around all day and did nothing like yeah, it was considered yeah. lazy like yeah. not being productive was bad yeah. and being productive was good right, right. Uh, especially at the turn of the century so yeah. everything kind of got like a moral attribute to it so people start feeling guilty when they're not doing anything like i get a day off in my seven day stretch, I get one day off a week yeah. and it's like, I feel so guilty for just laying it's on the crazy, couch. Right? I like, know, I don't know where that morality comes in. Um, but back to the floating, cause I'm yeah. really curious. Yeah. Now I just want to ask you, I have so, I had so many questions spinning in my head there. So now the salt, cause I had a chronic leg injury and I swear it was the ocean and the salt water that took it away from me. Right. I went up to Mexico and the, the salt water just did a numbers on my body yeah. for, so 1100 pounds of epsom salt i can imagine like i remember hearing from skateboarders back in the day like professional ones you know the bumps and bruises they yeah. take epsom salt baths every right. day so yeah. i imagine the mass amounts of salt must just be super beneficial for the body as well yeah i mean that's kind of the the folk wisdom like every doctor will tell you if you if or a chiropractor after you get a treatment like to have an epsom salt bath because you you take magnesium in kind of transcutaneously you know oh is that what it is it's magnesium from it Mm -hmm. so it's magnesium sulfate is epsom salt so you take Mm -hmm. magnesium in it and i mean every tissue um like seems to use magnesium like skeletal muscle of of nice i heard magnesium is especially good for guys as well for testosterone enhancement have you ever heard of that at all yeah 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 there's some i have heard that there's some uh like topical um topical uh, supplements you can use to they're supposed to boost testosterone eh? and their magnesium nice. magnesium and zinc i think now are you guys still involved in that the nootropics as well you know what we were selling on and stuff for a long time and mm-hmm. then um health canada kept making them change their nutritional product number like every eight to eight months to a year kind of thing and after mm-hmm. the third time they just said screw it for for retail in canada so they, you can you can have it shipped to you in canada mm-hmm. but they, they you can't you know, distribute it no man what like what is that the health number like what does that mean exactly it's like for, they, health canada kind of cracked down on um uh on supplements on, like on vitamins and stuff like okay. so you can't make any claims like if you're selling like some holistic stuff mm-hmm. and like whatever if it was um echinacea you can't say that it it boosts the immune system unless there's like it, it really favors the drug companies where they have like the kind of double blind placebo studies behind what they're selling, you know? Okay. So, so they, I, that seems to be when it happened was 
you can't make any claims about what your your supplements do. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that was in relation to why they had they kept having to change their like registration number to sell in Canada. Mm-hmm. But it was apparently it was a big hassle for for on it, just kind of not worth the not worth the time. Yeah. Eh? yeah, yeah. There's something similar that happened with supplements. Was in Britain and in Canada with that. Yeah, like I've heard with like so. proteins and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, yeah they're having a tough time. Uh, there's real big legislation almost, isn't there? Turning yeah. around the corner with those type of products. Yeah. And there might have been for there might have been some people abusing like you know making claims about certain things and people kind of get sucked into spending a whole bunch of money on stuff that might be questionable you know but mm. so but it seemed to be a little heavy handed. Mm. That's one I'm real fascinated with too with kind of like the the alternative medicines but there's just been some big studies with the psilocybin recently yeah. hasn't there in Denver just legalized yeah it. Man. and I I just watched uh, one of the Rogan podcasts and, and the um, I forget the uh, microbiologist name or what what exactly he was studying but it was along the lines of the lion's mane mushroom and yeah. the psilocybin regrowing the myelin sheath around yeah, the neurons and stuff yeah. and especially with dementia yeah. and the microdosing have you yeah. looked into that at all yeah well yeah yeah I've been but that that's kind of the only um, the only thing we really sell in supplement wise is the four sigmatic stuff. You heard of those guys? No. They're, they're some, it's a Finnish company and they sell it's mushrooms. I guess mushroom tea was a big thing in, in Finland for a long time. Uh-huh. Um, so the big ones they have is lion's mane, cordyceps, reishi, and um, uh, chaga. That's and so they, the two coffees they have are uh, uh, chaga and lion's mane and chaga and cordyceps. Mm-hmm. And I drink that lion's mane like it's going on. Really? Yeah. 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 So yeah, do you, how do you make the tea? Do you just buy so the lion's mane tea? So they and you just you just uh, uh, mix it with hot water and, and it's um, it's just mixes. It. It's like instant coffee with the with the mushrooms. No way. Yeah. Is it ex- where you get it online? Where do you get that? Yeah. I mean, we sell it at the shop, and it's like what is it? Twenty bucks a box for for ten ten packets. So that's not too bad. Yeah, like two bucks. Because I looked at the lion's mane, and that's rather rather yeah. steep in price isn't it for like the pill supplement yeah yeah that's yeah. pretty high yeah and uh and then they got a ratio the ratio one i love for for nighttime this ratio is supposed to just kind of bring you down mm-hmm. and it really seems to work man. that's kind of my nighttime ritual like a couple hours before bed have a ratio tea and just start kind of toning it down you know nice. yeah I sleep great the lion's mane have you notice any effects with that yeah like it seems they, that's the they, it seems to give you a little cognitive boost like it's got a nootropic effect Nice. And the coffee's great because it's only got 50 milligrams of caffeine, so it's half, what, half of a normal cup of coffee, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'm not as jittery, and I'm, yeah, I tend to drink too much coffee anyway. So yeah, I'm trying me. to cut the yeah. coffee back even before the podcast, I'm like, no coffee. No, man. No. You know, peeing and all that, yeah. I just find it breaks up. I, I like to have one a day, yeah. like a, a good 10, 30 one, just to keep me going, cool. you know, after the morning, but any time yeah. after that, I don't know. Yeah, I don't like the Anytime afternoon, and it starts messing with my sleep, too. Yeah, I sweat, too. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm naturally thin and, and pretty high metabolism. I can yeah. run like with barely sweating and I drink a cup of coffee after the second one and I'm, I'm sweating. <laughs> yeah. So not a huge fan of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, it'd be curious. I'm curious to see what the psilocybin, yeah. I, I hope they do some cool research in that. Cause I was even thinking my grandma, she's 96 and it was just her birthday and she's got like right. full blown dementia. And I almost wondered like what it would be like if people, like if there was studies where they start microdosing and if you could see those effects reversing yeah. on people, like, that would just be something else. Crazy, man. But time see, will that's tell, the, I guess. That's the least research part of, of psychedelics is the uh, like the micro, like the sub-perceptual dose. Yeah. Right? It, there's, there hasn't been much much research on that. But no. but I got some buddies who've been uh, doing it for like... like Microdosing? Point, yeah. Nice. Like yeah, I've been very gram. curious and starting. I, I had a little bit and I did it a few years back in, in a nice month-long stage. And yeah. I don't know if it was placebo effect or not, but I, I felt pretty darn good from it. Like Yeah, man. And I the the advice I got on how to do it is is uh you know, do it for a month and just just do it and then kinda of look back on that month and just see if there's if you you know, behave they made different choices or if just see how that month was, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because it's, yeah, you don't feel it. It's not something that you do. Yeah, I think that's something too that has to be clarified for people. Yeah. You're not taking magic mushrooms and yeah. tripping every day. It's, yeah. it's such a minute, what is it, 0. 0.4 of a gram? Yeah. That's recommended, I would say, even smaller I think than like, that. Yeah, 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.4. 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.4. 0. 4, even, yeah. And then you take it every four days, I think. It's not every day from what I've understood. Okay. It's, it's been like the, the studies I saw online right. that say do it every four days. Okay. And I don't know what you've seen about that. I, I'm not really familiar with that. No. With the, but you said you have buddies who have been trying that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Any reports from them or? Yeah, they said, it, it, yeah, it, they said they like it. Like it feels, and whether it's placebo again or, or not, but um, like they feel, 
Mm-hmm. Like, I think there's some focus benefits and, and uh, yeah. I noticed too, there's a big correlation between CEOs, they say, like F- Fortune 500 company CEOs right. who are using psilocybin and or LSD no in way. microdosing. Yeah, really? there's a super high percentage that no are doing way. it. I, I read that in Tim Ferriss's book, really? uh, Tools of the Titans. Apparently, it's a super common trend in Silicon Valley wow. and in, in the States. Is a yeah. lot of people are doing that just for cognitive functioning, for, for memory, for, for all those things. It's cool. super helping. Now, that's also in my studies of the tank, that's a big lore with the tank too, is it not? Yeah. Is, is altered states of mind kind of been mm-hmm. going into the tank. So what's through owning a float tank place, what's what's your experience of that, I guess? Have you seen people do that? Is that a common thing? Is that yeah. something you recommend, don't recommend to people? I mean, it says in our waiver not to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, but I mean, everyone's an adult who comes in there, you know, and kind of make their own decisions. Like, I mean, safety is our, is our number one concern mm-hmm. in that regard. Like, um, you know, edibles, like edible cannabis is a big one for like people like to do going in there. And people ask me that all the time. And, and personally, like, I like just floating. Just, I, I just like the kind of the, uh, this, like sober floating is, is great for me. Like, cause it's, yeah. you know, it's meditation and stuff and, and kind of introducing it, introducing something else is, is it changes it. Like it's, it's even, even, um, like edible, cannabis is super visual where well, you wouldn't think it would be but when the mm-hmm. in the darkness in, in there like it's it's really visual it's pretty it's pretty trippy and um like the the those states of mind that you can reach in the tank on your own mm-hmm. are are profound enough like they're worthy of, of mm-hmm. exploration in, in their own right mm-hmm. yeah i think that's 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 my own thing um and uh and then if you want to you know if you want to have some experiences doing doing it the other way that's that's great too like it's mm-hmm. it's all it's all what you're looking for i guess so where yeah. you're at huh? totally. that's what i kind of that's the place the revolution i've taken with experiencing psychedelics in my life and after having maybe we'll touch on it later but big ayahuasca ceremony is mm-hmm. i've kind of come out of that and been like i want to gain it all now without the biological free lunch almost you know what yeah. I mean? because yeah, yeah. you know you're unlocking something there for lack of better words without the work you know what I mean? Yeah. I can eat five grams of mushrooms right now. Right. Have a profound experience. Yeah. Not really, maybe take some things out of it, experience yeah. some things, but kind of not really integrate a lot. Yeah. Well, maybe that's not the right way of saying it, but it's not as profound as when you sit there for an hour in meditation, work for it, right. and you come up with this hour of bliss after. Yeah. That's like fully, you know, fully earned almost, sure. you know what I mean? Where it's just experienced. I, I find there's a difference in that now where I want to get to it from that normal state. Yeah. I just had a big place with that lately. Yeah. And, yeah. And, oh, sorry. No, no, but, and back to the thing too, I, I caveat back to the, the edible marijuana. I, I find there's a real caution now with that, with cannabis being legal. I even know I work for a drug addiction facility, right? And they're all, they're telling people it's harm reduction to eat edibles instead yeah. of smoking because the effects that it has on your lunch were on your lunch on your, <laughs> on your lungs. It has effects on your lunch too. It does, <laughs> but I feel like from the research I've studied, and I'm not going to be able to articulate because I'm such a layman with all this stuff. Yeah, I'm not claiming to be an expert in anything, right, right. There, but. When you ingest marijuana, it's a totally difficult, different chemical response than it is smoking. It. Yeah. Like it's almost doing something totally different. Yeah. I feel like that's where people don't understand. Yeah. It almost takes on the, the, the psychedelic component where you could have visuals, you could have, you know, out of body experience, oh, yeah. you could have different effects. So when they put that as almost a harm reduction, I was kind of like, I don't know about that. You know, yeah. it's, it's kind of. And, and you can turn people right off. Like, you know, people who, uh, a lot of, you know, elderly people are using it for chronic pain or, or um, like an anti-nausea kind of thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. But if you overdo it on edibles, you can have a really terrible experience. Yes. Yeah. And that's like mm-hmm. it could turn people off to, yes. to cannabis pretty quick. If you've, if you've done that. I've like known people. I've known yeah, people man. who aren't smokers and they said, okay, we'll get some cookies, you right. know, and they hammer down two cookies or they wait an hour because, oh, nothing's happening. Totally. And Bam. Classic I've seen mistake. people almost wanting to go to the hospital because they feel like they've been going yeah. out of their minds from it. So Oh, we've taken people to the hospital, man, in the ambulance. Re- in the lots, ambulance? Lots. Really? Oh, yeah? Yeah. I guess yeah. so. You probably see it all from every yeah. drug there is under the sun. Huh? Oh, we had a dude at uh, Rock the Fort and it came in as overdose at Rock the Fort. So we screamed out there because we thought it was like, you know, <laughs> yeah. someone 
trying to relive the 70s out there and uh we get out there and there's this dude in his trailers family's all around freaking out and he's just like kind of just rocking back and forth we're like hey man would you would you take and he said oh doug came by with a brownie and so right away it's just you know from a 10 down to three all right you'll be all right and then see he still wanted to go to the hospital and he's just telling my partner you know man like time time is just it's not moving like it's supposed to he's going and, and then he said he looks him right in the eye and says what are my chances and my partner says of what living yeah he says what are my chances of one to ten ten show me with your fingers <laughs> so my partner does this. still needs like, that trust yeah, eh? like six times on the way to the hospital he just look at him show me with your fingers again ten. yeah but yeah it's it's a big thing man Cause so so training. i imagine does it and i've heard i've seen a lot of articles online with firefighters and paramedics how's the stress of that do you, how do you take on that? Is it stressful seeing people with drug overdoses, all that stuff going on in the city? Oh, yeah. Do you take that home with you, or is it something that you oh, can sure. leave behind at work? It seems to be something you kind of come in and out of, you know, like the the um, like the model that they seem to be adopting is the um, kind of what the military went to, like a critical incident stress. Yeah, critical incident stress. Um, so, like, you know you kind of just you dip down like you're you're coping 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 and then all of a sudden you know something whether it's just too much or things start to compound and you just kind of dip into like a into a um a spot where you just can't handle it or just sticking with you you know what i mean mm -hmm. and then you got to do things to kind of kind of get back like um oh for sure like anybody who's who, who does those jobs for forever like just being around death and kids and stuff you know Suffering. what I mean yeah well that's what bringing it back to the float and meditation are I think is almost like the crazy importance to it which is nuts which which, which I think we never allow ourselves to do at all is yeah. I work in the social work field I've worked everything from custody child welfare yeah. you know addictions I work in schools yeah and you do you do dip <clears throat> down and you hit like a burnout stage where you don't mm -hmm. even know you're in burnout oh, man. And, and it's just like you're almost like numb yeah, to yeah. everything and you're exhausted and you can't get your tank back yeah like fill back up yeah. so that's something with floating and meditation i think is so yeah. important and they taught us that in school like self-care yeah, i don't know why it is and i don't know and that's where i'm looking so forward to getting back in the tank too is we almost like i have this wicked benefits package and i never go for massages i never go yeah. for cairo when i just need it you know i mean yeah. it's so weird that we just never give that to ourselves. yeah you know it's at our disposable almost. Totally. totally so with meditation has that you said that's been a part of your journey i'm kind of curious mm -hmm. of how you got to the float tanks right what was your journey of progression where like caterpillared and snowballed to the point where you're like hey let's open a float tank yeah. business you know where yeah. was your first kind of introduction to meditation where you really said hey this is something cool yeah. in my life um is a teacher in kenora mr hewitt he taught a, a class called uh, world religions mm -hmm. and uh when he got to the buddhism part you know he, he had us all like meditate so like what, what grade was that in? that was in grade 10. that's so crazy bring it up that was yeah. literally like my exact same yeah. thing world religions cool, grade right? 11 at so st pat's cool. the exact same thing but i'll let you continue yeah your story. And, and it was just that you know and then he had us uh th like a few sessions and it was really profound for me yeah and i just kind of got into reading about buddhism for a long time and and then got into uh martial arts <clears throat> at 19 like tai chi and aikido and, and stuff and and uh kind of that just eastern philosophy in general you know and then mm -hmm. um i went to japan for a couple of years to teach teach english and uh went to a lot of zen temples and, nice. and did some i didn't know that about you yeah, yeah so yeah. you were in kenora at in your high school days uh just for grade 10 i went to i went to like i went to four different high schools so it just kind of every every year seemed to change but um yeah grade 10 and part of grade 11 was in kenora okay yeah cool place huh super cool i love kenora yeah it's a, such a deadly vibe there yeah i love it man that that was literally my my first experience too it, it felt super cheesy at first and like you know high school kids had to tone down the yeah. giggling and all that stuff but, yeah. but a teacher in world religions played like i think it would have been like a 40 minute relaxation from start to finish no way where you went through the whole process you know scanning the body and i'd never yeah. done a body scan in my life and, yeah you know just deep breathing and stuff right and i remember leaving there and you know this was grade 11 so pot was around and i had smoked pot and yeah. you know had altered states of being and i remember coming out of there being like 
whoa, like yeah. I feel so different. Like yeah. everything is moving slower, but not in a in a sedated way, but in a, a more clear way. And super interesting. I, that's my experience from a float that I took away, which yeah. I thought was just so cool. I say it lasted with me for probably two to three days after yeah. my float was. I left and I don't know, everything was just kind of brighter, yeah. kind of calmer. Yeah. You know, you center yourself down and I think the world adapts to that almost. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's hard to explain. How it is, man. Your inner is. world projects your outer world. They're almost reflections, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we're talking before we started the podcast about parasympathetic and sympathetic. Right. But bringing yourself back to that parasympathetic, the calm state, Yeah. it's just... How your reactions are so different. Everything that reverberates off of you yeah. just comes back to you calmer. Like if you're in that heightened state and someone you know cuts you off, like you, we talked about before, it's pissing you off all day. Right. You're driving, you're thinking about, I should have said this. Yeah. Now you're not listening to someone when they're talking to you. Yeah. You know, you're getting in a fight with your partner, whatever it is. Yeah. Versus, okay, they cut me off. Cool. Whatever. They need to get somewhere quicker than I did. Yeah. And you keep going, and yeah. it stuck with me. So that was Ooh. my my big takeaway from it, which which I really loved. Yeah. And all earned too. All earned. You know what I mean? Yeah. The ninety minutes, and that was me. I had a pre background, pretty deep pre background in meditation. So right. for me, like when that ninety minutes hit, I was like, what? It's ninety already? That's like awesome. yeah. I just went into a deep deep place cool, with man. that. Um, but yeah, I, I love the parasympathetic. Where'd you learn about that? Like the sympathetic, parasympathetic model? <clears throat> um, I mean, th that's a big part of uh, like medicine. Like in, in paramedic school, they talk about that, like in different stages of shock and stuff. And so you got to know like what are sympathetic symptoms and, you know, parasympathetic symptoms kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those are kind of the two branches of your, your um, autonomic nervous system, like the, the kind of the involuntary nervous system, you know? Okay. And uh so yeah, sympathetic is, is designed to keep you alive in, in times of you know stress and danger, and it's it's the fight or flight or the freezer or freezer flight more like mm -hmm. you know more more um, they say it's it's more of a freezer flight kind of thing. But so yeah, it's, it um, shunts blood away from your your organs and your mm -hmm. digestive system and towards your skeletal muscle to allow you to run or, or fight or whatever you got to do, mm -hmm. and it mobilizes glucose um, and like through the kind of glucocorticoid system. And so that you're, you you got resources allocated to survive, gotcha. and it's supposed to be a short term a short term thing, you know. So mm -hmm. you, you get away from from whatever's chasing you, you get back with your family, and then you get back into parasympathetic. But the sympathetic is quick because it has to be because you got to mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Like it's like within a second, adrenaline is in your bloodstream, and then it's <clears throat> like the the cortisol is is a little bit longer. Um, but so that's supposed to be just short bursts. But we're supposed to live in, in parasympathetic because that's where your you know your digestive is is working like it's supposed to like all the um, tissue regeneration and, and stuff like that that's all going on in the parasympathetic mm -hmm. and it's not like they're they're kind of one or the other but you 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 know you can kind of tilt over to yeah. to one side kind of thing mm -hmm. um, and it just seems like learning to feel that like like you said, going into a float after 90 minutes, like when I come out of there, like it's a plummet, man. Like the, the, how I feel when I come out of there compared to how I went in, it's just every time it, it, I'm just boggled with how wound I was before I got in, even though I didn't even feel like I was, I was yeah. wound real tight. Like I come out and I'm just so loose, you know? And I think getting accustomed to that transition coming into parasympathetic with whatever, whatever means you get there is super important. Like in breath work, there's a lot of breath work you can do to kind of get tuned into how you're breathing, you know, because mm -hmm. that's, that's a big one, like the diaphragmatic, because it's a lot of it, they say is mediated through the vagus nerve, which travels through the, through the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the only mechanism, but, but breathing diaphragmatically is, is real key to, uh, to kind of stay in parasympathetic. And mm -hmm. a lot of us aren't really aren't, good at it you know when you say to breathe in your belly like we think belly but like it's supposed to be 360 like you should feel your back coming into the chair you know what i mean so your your whole the whole yeah the, the whole region is expanding huh? yeah what what do you think would be some things that knock people into parasympathetic <clears throat> I mean, into sympathetic rather like the less healthier fight or flight on a regular basis like is it easy to trip into that you think like from your medical background or is it like would coffee do that sure. you know would stress like is there one or the other like a certain thing that trips it, people in or what do you think about that yeah i think you know anything that you perceive as a threat is kind of is kind of uh is kind of the the 
they call it the HPA axis, like your hypothalamus pituitary adrenal. Like, so your hypothalamus is like the relay station in your brain for information coming in. And if something you perceive something as a threat or, or it's somehow endangering some part of you, like you physically or emotionally or whatever, mm-hmm. like it can, it can trigger that, that stress response, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I think we get hyper um, attuned to it, especially today. There's just so much coming in. Like we're, you don't even realize like when you're scrolling through and watching the lives of beautiful people, like you think you're just watching cool people, but your, your brain is, is interpreting like, Oh, I'm not that I like that. I can never be that. Or like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like those, those things, there's just so much information coming in and we don't give ourselves a break, like just processing constantly, you know, mm-hmm. and there's no, there's no space in, in, uh, it's no quiet, be, really, no if quiet, you think man. about it. No. That's it. My, my kind of analogy that I bring to it, and it kind of correlates to something that puts you in, uh, into sympathetic, but say driving, like, right. we were designed to drive. Like, yeah. we were designed to walk. Yeah. I heard eight kilometers a day. That's what the body is designed right. for. And some of the people I know have lived the longest, like I have an aunt who's, who's 102 and still going strong. Yeah. I, I knew people in my neighborhood who lived to like close to 100. Mm-hmm. They walked everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like they never drove. So if you think of that driving, like you're, you're, things are flying at you and you got to be safe. Yeah. But my analogy to being sympathetic or parasympathetic, like the vast difference is when you start your car in the dead of winter, minus 40, right. and the RPMs scream and rev and the whole car is just yeah. buzzing because it's not... Right. warmed up it's not calm but you let it sit and warm up and then the rpm yeah. down and you don't realize wow i started driving that car when it was revved right up yeah versus i don't know that's just always like when i teach it to kids and yeah, when i man. work with and, and addictions and stuff like that it's like that's the analogy i use just that revved that's we don't realize one. how much revved we are from so much yeah it's gonna be interesting to see the effect that this has yeah. over time on people just being out of our natural for sure state so much yeah now is the sympathetic for your medical background because i've been curious to ask about this yeah is it and you may or may not know but is it connected to the lymphatic system at all are you um, aware of that like the lymphatic system and your endocrine system because the endocrine system for sure i don't really know what the lymph i'm, I'm sure it does have have uh have um an impact on the lymphatic system i don't i don't know you're not too familiar with that because that's i'm super curious because i've just been researching it and apparently we have like four times the amount of lymph fluid that we do blood in our body and there's no pump yes you're the pump exactly you're the pump and i just saw this thing i was like what really that's beneficial like rebounders are coming back in the little trampolines you know oh yeah yeah. rebounders i didn't say big ones because lymph what it does is it passes back and forth through your bloodstream yeah. and, and you have uh, lymph nodes like in your armpits, yeah. on the top of your head, your yeah. feet, everywhere. And they're usually connected to uh, the endocrine system and, and your hormone relay to it with yeah. what it senses. So when we're flooded with all these things and not clearing out that lymph, it's just yeah. a build up and that's where disease kind of Yeah, and it's supposed to take away metabolic waste. Yes. Right? And, yeah. And uh, yeah, Oh, dude, and there's a just recently discovered, they call it the glymphatic system in your brain. One of the, one of the functions of sleep is your glymph cells, um, sorry, glial cells, uh, dilate. So they get bigger so that it allows cerebral spinal fluid to, to go through your brain to flush out, to flush out um, the metabolic waste from your neurons. Mm-hmm. which if left in there so if you get insufficient sleep and not enough of that flushing going on mm-hmm. that's that's the stuff that turns into the plaque like the amyloid plaques and stuff that it's linked to dementia and uh oh no yeah way. man like sleep is big dude it's, yes like you want to talk about sympathetic lack of sleep is probably the biggest one like if you're not if you're not slept properly and i mean work and shift work any kind of shift work mm-hmm like the World Health Organization is, has classified it as a probable carcinogen. And for them to even use that term, like there's a lot mm-hmm. of, there's a lot of research gone, gone behind it. Like it, it accelerates any kind of disease process. Um, yeah, it just And that's accelerates. what carcinogens do? I've heard that term thrown around. Do you uh, cancer causing. Cancer causing, that's yeah. what carcinogen yeah. will, will progress towards? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's just something unhealthy in the body that left there. Yeah, it's something that's gonna make cancer more likely or, or cause. Mm-hmm. cause cancer and, and uh have you heard that matthew walker guy talk about sleep he's been on the rogan and that that guy blew it's the guy kind of the comb like comb to yeah. the side here he blew, British my dude mind. blew my mind there was man. not one second of that podcast yeah. where i wasn't like dear yeah. god keep going like I keep know, speaking man. it was just mind-blowing yeah. and backed by science like yeah. it, i believe he said and I, once again I'm, i don't know anything so yeah, i'm yeah. just 
trying to oh, recall yeah, what I remember, okay. is he said it's like the number one cause of death is yeah. sleep deprivation yeah. in the sense that it, it correlates to obesity, it correlates to heart failure, yeah. it correlates to, you know, premature accidents, yeah. everything. That was something else. Yeah, man. It's, it's, uh, and, and like the message he's saying is like, you need seven to eight hours of sleep. You know what I mean? For mo- for the most part, there's like a, a, I can't remember what the fraction of people who can, who can kind of thrive on four to five. And everybody who hears that there's that kind of person thinks, oh, that's me. I must be one of those. But it's like 0.7% of the population is that is that phenotype or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, but yeah, your your cortisol is 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 high in mm-hmm. that you know the stress hormone yeah. or whatever. So your blood sugar is high. Like so, you're you're higher risk for diabetes and higher risk for stroke, atherosclerosis. All the big ones are 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 just completely exacerbated by by lack of sleep you know and mm-hmm. and it's something that's so that's so ignored you know mm-hmm. like that we don't even consider it and then if you can kind of organize your life to get good sleep everything seems to fall in, like you know fall into place a lot easier yeah you know do you have a routine yourself i'm, I'm getting a lot better like no caffeine after noon you mm-hmm. know I, I was always like i would have coffee after supper or whatever, and i didn't think it affected me because i could fall asleep but you could still fall asleep huh? yeah have you now i've heard this someone just told me this recently that caffeine is an eight hour slow release have you heard that at all yeah like I, a lot of people think you, you get your caffeine you get your shot you get hyped up for a couple hours gives you that yeah. energy rush then gone but I've just heard people telling me data say, no, no, I looked into a caffeine slow release. Like it has an eight hour effect, one cup. Yeah, it's got like an eight hour half life, right? So like half, okay. like eight hours later, half that amount is still in your in your system. So like, yeah, if you had a, a cup of coffee at two o'clock and then and then you you know, you go to sleep at ten o'clock, mm-hmm. it's like you just drank half a cup of coffee. Essentially, like you still have that, that caffeine in your system. Mm-hmm. And then you're you're it kind of puts off your melatonin, like your peak melatonin, which tells you tells you to go into sleep Mm -hmm. and then so you're not hitting those stages like you hear him talking about those stages of sleep and like the the non-REM sleep and the and the REM sleep and in his book he's got a brilliant analogy of um he's talking about the deep stages of sleep like the non-REM like stage four sleep Mm -hmm. like in and that's you know usually thought of as like the deep restorative sleep where you get all the stuff he talks about it in terms of like your brain kind of assimilating and um all your experience of the day and, and yeah. so if you're making a like a relief sculpture and you're non-rem sleep you're just carving away all the all the stuff that's not necessary like all the superfluous superfluous material mm-hmm. and then when you go into the REM sleep like it's a lot more metabolically active that's your rapid eye movement stuff yes and then you make in fine detail so like, you dream the, in yeah. the rapid eye movement okay yeah. i, I kind of hear these terms a lot and i think i correlate one to the other but if the deep sleep where it's like the first four hours that's non-rem is that correct non-rem yeah so then that's where they think the dmt is pumping hard eh where there's kind of thoughts about that yeah like you, i don't know i don't know about that too yeah, yeah so REM sleep usually kicks in around they say like what like i think so you go through cycles eh? like you go you go one two three four REM, and then it starts over again one two yes, three four I REM, and four it's, hours. i think it's like a 90 minute to two hour cycle or whatever mm-hmm. so this is kind of I, again i'm not an expert but yeah but uh so like those stages hitting those stages is important so getting like quality of sleep is a real thing and when you're when you're going to like using you know ambient or gravel or whatever mm-hmm. like it's unconsciousness but it's not sleep yeah it's sedation yeah man sedation That's I've, I've been yeah. very concerned because admittedly marijuana is a part of my life and right. on a fairly consistent basis yeah and when i do cut it off for a month to two months at a time I like, I like to i dream like yeah. crazy so and and and, and then i'm getting scared and i don't get scared but i get mm-hmm. kind of like the biological free lunch thing again like right, right. you know like where I take something for yeah. a certain type of conditioning that I'm used yeah. to, whether it's training, whether it's martial arts, whether it's muscle relaxation, whether it's sleep. Yeah. But then I'm going, oh, I'm not getting that REM sleep where dreaming for me when I've spent three months in a temple and, you know, clean as a whistle. Right. Like my dreams are almost like, for lack of better words, a little bit prophetic. Like they, yeah. they're like my subconscious telling me you feel guilty about that. So it manifests in a dream and yeah. it's like, you got to deal with this. It's like almost like psychology 101. Yeah. But in my subconscious, yeah, man. I, I don't know how to articulate yeah. it better than that. So that's where I'm, what, I don't know what your thoughts on that, like the effects, it's almost sedation. Like he said again, right? Yeah. Just getting that from, from Matthew Walker again, this cannabis or THC in particular suppresses um, REM sleep. Okay. Uh, so does alcohol. Yes. So when you if you drink alcohol before, and that's why, and he says like your brain has a counter 
like it, it, there's so much REM sleep that it needs and it, it's almost like it's keeping track. And so like really kind of um, severe alcoholics will start to almost enter that REM uh, realm of consciousness in while they're awake you know mm -hmm. what I mean like the delusions and stuff yeah, like that the DTs, yeah or if you're not if you're deprived of sleep for a long time like your your brain goes there because it almost needs to like it's mm -hmm. it seems to be a um like a non-negotiable function of your brain like that mm -hmm. it needs to, to kind of process that stuff and and like he yeah bring it back to that analogy like you're making that fine detail so like your non-rem sleep you're cutting away you know all the memories and stuff that you've processed in your short term it's cutting away everything that's not essential and then keeping the pieces and then kind of connecting it to who you are, your objectives, your past, like stuff, because your brain is, is supposed to keep you safe. You know what I mean? Like that's the function of your brain. Trying to make sense of stuff. Yeah. Whether something hurt your feelings really bad yeah. that day and it, you know, it went into a pit in your stomach. Yeah. And then I th this, this is what I'm trying to understand for what you said. Now I think it's kind of true. So the deep sleep, it's kind of cutting away all the traffic noise, all the trees you've seen, you know, all the yeah. driving down the street. Like, it blows my mind in dreams. Like, you can drive down Arthur Street in a dream and every house is there like a virtual simulation. Yeah. And, he, you know, if I asked you, hey, what house is on the middle of Arthur Street? You'd be like, oh, I don't know. Like, well, what's yeah. the house? But when you're driving in that dream, you're looking around and it's all there. Yeah. So all that information is there. Yeah. And it's cutting it away and then it leaves back, say, that emotional experience. And it might manifest it as, say, a dog attacking you in, in the dream. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Where you yeah, feel yeah. threatened or whatever, you know? Yeah. But it's that process of getting that out almost, right? Yeah. It's interesting. It's in, and and um, I, yeah, Walker talks about that a lot too. Like evolution is thrifty, you know. Like with with resources and stuff, anything that costs energy mm -hmm. is usually unless it's absolutely essential. Like the the body doesn't keep it. You know what I mean? Because resources were like for the for the vast kind of span of our mm -hmm. evolution were, were scarce. You know. So and REM sleep is metabolically costly, and it seems to be kind of non negotiable. So it's 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 a it's a a real primary function of our brain and, and sleep in general too like the way he's talking about a third of your life you're completely open to predation and you're not looking for food you're not reproducing but it's it's essential you know what I mean mm -hmm. and then in, in today's world we're you know yeah I think we can just cut it back to five hours and, and be good you know people take pride in that yeah man like that. I, I, I can get yeah. by on five hours of sleep they, they like that and I've heard about a study it wasn't from that podcast, but it was from a different one. Yeah. And they did, a, was it was at Harvard or Stanford. It was a pretty reputable one. Right. But they let them get two hours of sleep to start. So they went into that deep, uh, mm -hmm. deep non-REM sleep. And then when they're about to hit REM, I guess they had trackers on them. They will come up every 15 minutes. Right. So they let them sleep like for the next six hours. But yeah. every 15 minutes they had to get up. Right. Go back down. So they never got into deep dreaming. Okay. And they said within like a week, people were, were, across the board reporting yeah. schizophrenic type yeah. behaviors of seeing things yeah. hearing voices telling them burn down the school yeah. hearing seeing the devil so yeah, it's super interesting they're almost trying to make a correlation between schizophrenia and like a, a terrible yeah. disposition in the brain where they're right. not clicking into that deep REM sleep where now their brain is going you got to make that up in real life almost yeah. I'm not a doctor or anything, but I, I, it seems to make sense you yeah. know, with what the research is saying, with what happens if you don't get sleep. Like you go three days without sleep, you're, you're pretty much off the board for functionability. Right? Yeah. You can't, I don't know the technical terms, but yeah. I've heard people say, oh, you're legally insane after four yeah. years. You know, everyone yeah. has those bad oh, kind of sure. cliche things, but yeah. uh, I, I could believe it that you're probably not in the best state of mind after a couple of days. You should no be sleep. driving for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So sleep, that's another big one. How do you find it's difficult to sleep at some, I know you have a partner and me, that's something I even struggle with. It's yeah. just that quality of sleep almost, right. you know what I mean? I have to put in earplugs. I, I have earplugs. to have the, the yeah. earplugs too. Yeah. yeah. So do you find with the shift work, how do you do that in the daytime? I'm, I'm oh, super curious. I want to ask sure. you if you get this from, from the, from the shift work. I was getting terrible sleep paralysis. I don't know if you've ever experienced yeah, that. Okay. The daytime coming home sleeping, I would lay down on my back and then I'd be like frozen Whoa. where it was just my mind kind of coming in and out and it got kind of scary because really? you'd like be like, I'm sleeping and then your mind kind of trips in from the fear projections, whether they be, you know, someone's at the door, you know, you yeah. get scared, but sleep paralysis was a huge one for me. Really? Like I, I, I haven't had a whole lot of... you like, never had I it. I think I, I've had it where I wake up or I'm dreaming about something that I'm running or whatever and I'm physically, I feel like I'm physically trying to do it but you know, you're like you're paralyzed, so like you can't, mm -hmm. like I can't in my dream. But but it's kind of, 
kind of waking too, but I've never had that where I woke up and I'm just, I can't. You just froze. Uh, yeah. So how, how's your sleep in the daytime? What kind of, so you get like a seven to seven and then you sleep <coughs> from seven to three or you still try for your eight hours? How do you manage I'm that? pretty lucky for... now that I, I only take day shifts because it just, you know, I was doing night shifts still and, and then doing the shop as well, but it was just, it, it was unmanageable for me. Like I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't function the next day because I would have to get a little bit of sleep and then go back to the shop and then I'd end up just blowing a whole night's sleep essentially, you know? So, mm. I, but when I was, I, I'm pretty lucky with, I'm able to sleep. We got blackout curtains and I hang blankets and make the room black and I wear your plugs and stuff. It's tougher though with a little one now, like, because yeah. if you have that, I hear them and I, I wake up. So that, that changes changes the sleep thing big time. Yeah, that's a funny theory I have. And I think there's truth to it. Yeah. I think when people have a kid or yeah. kids, I feel like that lack of sleep ages people. 100%. I feel like it does. And I feel almost yeah. guilty saying it because people probably listen and be like, oh, you know, it sounds a little judgmental, but you see it in people. Yeah. Like they have a couple kids and it's like, it yeah. wears on the body sure. a lot. But And you see like, the, I mean, testament to that is how I, like a, a toddler's nap schedule will just completely dominate your life. Like it's that important. Like if your kids nap, life is good. You know I mean? Sleep's that important sleeping? to them. Too, yeah, dude. Huh? Yeah. And and then if they're sleeping, you're sleeping, and then everybody's happy. But if he's not sleeping, you're not sleeping, and then you know it's just yeah. Those first those first few months, man. Like I had more like freakouts than ever in my life. I think like cause you're just so like you're not sleeping. You know. Not sleeping. Yeah. Man. That's intense. Yeah. Now what, so what role, cause now you personal trained at one time in your life yep. too. So what role is physicality still playing in your life? Cause we're kind of on the like touching on everything, the mind, sure. the body, and, yeah, yeah. you know, so is that still playing an active role? Like oh, what yeah. type of physicality are you getting in? Uh, so I've been, I got into a lot of like gymnastics strength training. I got, yeah. Which uh, I've been super curious at picking your brain about. Cause yeah, I went man. to your Instagram and I was like, damn, you look shredded like a gymnast and you're doing all these cool handstands with your legs dipping down yeah, and you're yeah. using the rings and with, with jiu-jitsu being so heavy in my life, you know, yeah. four to five days a week training, it's right. like, I need like a two to three day, like, strength training still helps, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. and, but I just need something different, something that's like, going to keep me right. tight and together, but yeah. not like, you know, deadlifting where, I, you know, I tweak in my hip one, so yeah. you know, it's, yeah, it's got yeah. a lot of wear and tear to it, so, For sure. so what are you doing with the gymnast style workouts? Uh, so, the uh, where I got started was, it was a, um, called Gymnastic Bodies, and he was a, the coach who made it, Coach Summer, he was the USA team coach for gymnastics. Um, so he would train people up to 18, like to get them ready for Olympic training. Like, mm-hmm. So he was like a top level coach. And then he made a program for um, adults. And the way I got into it was just pain. Like I was, my, I had some hip, low back stuff that was just chronic. And it, like, it was, I was questioning my whole future on how, like being able to work out. Like I couldn't, run every time I touched the kettlebell like I'd just be the next day I'd just be a mess you know what I mean yeah and it lasted about a year and and like I was doing massage and foam rolling every day and I just seemed to like not make any progress and so I got into that just to do something different gotta get what was the name of that again uh, it's called gymnastic bodies gymnastic com. bodies I want to look that up yeah okay yeah it's it's a cool it's a cool program so but the big change was the mobility stuff like they just a ton of stretching you know what I mean like shoulder extension which I never I never thought about like you know working toward middle splits and front splits and then the back bridging and stuff like that and just kind of restoring all those ranges of motion and then training them so you get strong like building strength through through those ranges of motion you know mm-hmm. and then get into the handstand stuff and then it kind of led me to the um been doing a lot of end range training like functional range yeah you're talking stuff. about that the other day and i'm super I, I didn't have time to kind of pick your brain about right. it so, so tell me all about that because i'm super curious yeah so and, yeah essentially the, the same thing so you, you just want to um like building strength at your end range so like um the way they map it out like the strength length curve or strength ten, length tension curve sorry so like the length tension curve of a, of a muscle like the mid range is always the strongest and then it drops off towards your end ranges. So like, you know, if you're doing the bicep, whatever, like your strongest at mid range mm-hmm. and then it drops off like at this, at the short end range and at the long at end the range. Constriction and, and constriction and extension yeah. is at its weakest essentially. Exactly. Okay. So like, you know, it, the, the weight's always going to be hardest to lift from here and then to get this last little bit, here's, here's usually, so it's usually maps out like a, like a big, um, a curve like a bell, you know yeah. what I mean? And so essentially, end range strength you're trying to build strength in the in the end ranges like 
both both long and short around the joint mm -hmm. and uh, and it gives you more access to those end ranges so like you know whether it's shoulder extension or, or shoulder flexion like you're building building strength and what that does is it, it allows your nervous system to feel comfortable and letting you go there you know what I mean so mm -hmm. like your stretch um, a stretch reflex is is uh, your nervous system kind of puts a governor on how far you can you can move into a range of motion mm -hmm. to keep you safe it's like so if they if they put you under anesthetic like you could probably do the splits like it's not the tissue length yes it's yeah. super interesting i just I had an injury in my wrist okay and i was like oh no my wrist is messed so he's like okay just relax relax because I, I i'm like i can't even get it past here yeah. and he's relax and then he's he's bending my wrist all right. the way back so he's like okay well you don't have a tear yeah you know it's nervous yeah. it's a nervous system and and my chiropractor told me about theory which you might know about as well is if that end range motion when you hit your maximum say your arms fully extended yeah in order not to tear it'll shut off the whole muscle like it'll kind of turn it off so to prevent injury because right. it knows it's been hitting it on the other side yes like on, the it, other, on the other yeah yeah, yeah. so it's hitting it it's, it's full extension range motion so it'll right. shut off that muscle yeah. in order to prevent it from getting injured and clenching up and tightening yeah. but uh so, but and, I, I cut you off oh, there, but, so i'm still trying to understand like how you strengthen the end range motion so say like can you use an example like say like a bench sure. press or a curl what that would look like so they they kind of treat it more like the, the foundational movements of, of each joint like for example shoulder rotation okay so it's an easy one to so you know you got internal rotation and and external rotation okay. so like internal rotation you get your you get your arm into in, internal rotation and do a, a long passive stretch mm -hmm. to get a little bit of tissue change you kind of so that you like you know from yoga like if you hold anything more than a minute mm -hmm. you know you get that like kind of uh like your, your body will give ease you more it, yeah. you know you kind of ease into it so they usually hold it for about 90 seconds and then you'd ramp up like in the internal rotation you'd ramp up an isometric contraction okay. and you kind of ramp up to your max and you want to get to like 80 90 percent of max voluntary contraction because that's where you're getting that's where you get some strengthening effect like that's yeah. why light weights don't get you strong you know what i mean yeah. like so you want to get so you ramp up that isometric contraction for about 15 seconds and then you pull to train the other side of the joint and so you're just kind of building presence in that that end range gotcha and uh yeah it's pretty profound man and, and so they also have a system of um controlled articular rotations they call it so whole body that's what rishi was probably telling you about like that yeah because that's what we do every time so for the neck like you know flexion rotation lateral flexion and and so you're you're expressing your full range of motion in each articulation without compensation from your other joints like a big one i notice is scapular function especially for a lot of guys it's it's now, scapular is your shoulder uh oh. your shoulder blade okay. so you know you're it's supposed to be able to move all around your rib cage and, and kind of glide around yeah and so so like the scapular um they call them cars control articular rotation the scap cars are you know you protract depress retract elevate and so you're making a big circle essentially yeah and we you know, when you first do it like you when you try to retract your whole spine's moving this way and, and it's just like you see people like having this big struggle with like just trying to move their scap you know what i mean yeah and because your brain like your 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 sensory motor cortex has mapped those two things together it's mapped like thoracic lateral flexion and scap retraction so whenever you do something that's that requires scap you're you're torquing your back like that you know what i mean yes and if you don't if it, they're not moving well then you get all tight in the in which i had chronically like th like thoracic stuff in, in my back you know mm -hmm. And so you're kind of like your brain is in a black box. It doesn't know it doesn't know where <clears throat> you are in space, except for the afferent feedback it gets back from the periphery. So like into your nervous system, your your um, nerves are sending signals on on where you are in space. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so if those two things are always mapped together, they're just mapped together. You know what I mean? So the f for me that that the process of doing cars on a regular basis. It just kind of gives your brain a higher resolution image of of what your body like what each joint does you know yeah. what i mean and it's profound the impact it can have for like chronic pain stuff like for for me that hip stuff yeah. just kind of went away like you know what i mean that that low back like anterior posterior tilt and yes. internal external rotation like separating those things and starting to train them like yeah. stuff just started to fix itself you know what i mean and and I learned that I was like a chronic anterior tilter. I have the exact same yeah, thing. So people don't know what the anterior pelvic tilt is. I yeah. think most guys struggle with that. And yeah. a lot of people don't realize what an anterior pelvic tilt is. It kind of looks like 
when your pot belly sticks out a little yeah. bit and hangs low yeah. and your back curves exactly. a lot. Yeah. And you usually see it to tell people, and the chiropractor showed me this in my physio because I do a lot of that, is you take your belt off yeah. and if your belt isn't fully round on it, if it's got yeah. a little dip, which a lot of belts will, mm. a lot of wear right in on the, the middle. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. in the back of the belt. That's yeah, a yeah. huge sign. So anyone listening, take a look at that. Totally. Or just look at yourself in the mirror from the side profile. Yeah. Usually we don't realize how many times a day we're standing yeah. and we're like, our stomach is just potted right, right out and my back is low, especially with sitting in chairs all day, with yeah. driving all day. So that one's been a nightmare for me. So that's, you've correlated that with your hips. What have you done for your hips to, uh, to help like with that? Fixing the rotation of the hips is, is big, like getting internal external rotation of the hip, mm -hmm. you know, and then everything, flexion, extension, um, and then your hip flexors, a lot of times, you know, especially in jets, man, because you're always flexed. You know what I mean? Like you mm -hmm. spend a lot of time, not a lot of time with your, your leg extended. You mm -hmm. know what I mean by extended? Like where your your knee goes behind your hips kind of thing. Yeah. And your your hip flexors are they, they go up past your pelvis and attached to your lumbar. And so if they're tight, they're pulling your lumbar into extension. That's your anterior tilt. So you're you're almost like your pelvis can't get in that posterior tilt. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that that was me. And that and like my massage therapist helped me help me kind of figure that out, you know? Yeah. And what really flared up was when Kelly was first born, I was holding him all the time and I would kind of almost like stick my belly out to let him sit on it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And just crushing back pain. Like Shows that's that's where back, it, that's yeah. where it really flared up. Yeah, I think and I think a lot, especially in this city, I think where a lot of mine came from was hockey. Right. Because you're like in that deep squat 100%. and you're like shoulders are forward yeah. and you're back. It got to the point where oh, I'm cramping up right now as I talk about this. I get cramps all the time. Uh, where it got to the point where it didn't even hurt so much is it just locked up. Like when yeah. I would play hockey, I couldn't even play anymore after like 18 because it was just like so tight. And if I kettlebells are the same way, you know, that like deep horse sit where you're throwing the kettlebell yeah. up and down like yeah. it just locks on me now where yeah. I, like i can't even move it gets so tight yeah so i i would love to learn more of what what you're talking about yeah, right. yeah come out man anytime we, i've been i've been running pretty informally and i got a bunch of dudes a bunch of people um coming a few times a week and, and just doing, were you doing that right out of the shop yeah we put a little gym in the back and i, I kind of want to get more focused on on the physical stuff and uh because it's the same thing, man. Like you're just kind of tuning in, tuning into your, your body. Like, you know, the more at home you feel in your body, the more at home you feel in the world. It's kind of, kind of mm -hmm. the idea, you know? And, and then in the tank, it's the same thing. You're just kind of going back home, back home. Yeah. To, yeah. Well, that's something I said in the last podcast, talking with Aaron too. And it just blows, blows my mind a little bit how people under prioritize the body. Yeah. Like, you know I mean? This is your vehicle. Like if yeah. you had a car, you wouldn't be well people do it with their cars too you know what i mean yeah. but like this is the car of life and yeah how much we just let it kind of run down For and not sure. and not give it the maintenance we need or the the attention it needs because yeah i don't know about anyone else i want to live to 100 i want to live past 100 yeah, i want to be running you know until i'm 80 i want to be sitting squatting yeah. doing jits till i'm 80 you know sure. doing all that and it takes a lot of work yeah um a big one for me it was like a kind of like a magic key have you ever heard of the psoas muscles yeah those were huge. Yeah. I went to see Serge Parody, a uh, uh, physiotherapist, and he did wonders for me. Cool. He, I was sitting there, I couldn't walk for like a <coughs> week, and he started digging into my stomach, and I was like, what is this going to do? Like, this is, mm -hmm. this, I don't know, here, here I go paying another hundred bucks, just <laughs> wasting my money. But he, he was rubbing the psoas I didn't know, and he was massaging them, and then yeah. he taught me all about them after, and I stood up, and I was like, wow. Yeah. So the psoas connect from your bottom rib right into your into your hip flexors dude yeah. not into your groin yeah and, and it's right. what like kind of pulls your 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 back out more that's the one it, that's it, that it, that's that hip flexor that, that hip flexors your, yeah that. so working with those has just made a world of difference so. yeah but you said how often are you doing the training out of your place there at float uh so right now it's monday wednesday thursday oh you're doing and it that consistently yeah huh? i got a group coming in and and uh i, I played with a bunch of different it, it, the biggest one for me is I got to free up more of my time so I can kind of devote more, you know, because the shop still takes lots of my time. And, and uh, but it's 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 my passion, man. And, and that the end range stuff, it's the stuff that I wish I would have known about in my 20s. You know what I mean? Like you say, like when you're playing hockey and, and you just kind of get broken. Mm -hmm. And it's it just it's so apparent to me now because I'm coming up on, you know, 38, like how many of my friends, they get hurt training. 
you know, like they get hurt doing the thing that's supposed to keep you healthy and keep you keep you active. Like the the you know the the information we have is 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 not serving us. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's so much out there. It's tough. Yeah, huh? man. yeah. Yes. And you're playing like training. You're playing with that stress response again. Like when you when you go into a hard training session, you're you're intentionally putting yourself into a sympathetic. Well, that's my brother. Brought, my brother had a, a nurse. He, he's not too active in the nursing right now, but he has all the formal training of it. And he's he said you got to be mindful of that. Like he yeah. says, when you got this two hundred pound guy on your back, yeah. he's trying to choke you out. Like yeah. your body doesn't know the difference between a bear and that. Like yeah, you've learned to be calm sure. in it, but. Yeah, you know your sympathetic body is telling you like it's yeah, pumping man. cortisol or whatever. I don't know the exact things, yeah. but you know so. And and your body doesn't know the difference between that kind of stress and the emotional stress you might have in your relationship and the professional stress you have from your job, mm-hmm. the stress you have from almost getting an accident on the way home. You know what I mean? So if you're having a bad week and then you go into a hard training session, like it's just all stress to your to your system. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. And then like you, you every, we've all had that. Like you. You're feeling kind of beat up. Maybe I shouldn't go to the gym. You go in there anyway and push it. Yes. And then you get sick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or you throw your back or whatever. Like that's something, there's a link in the chain that has to has to go. And and that piece of, of getting better at tuning into um, your, your parasympathetic, like feeling that, feeling that difference, like whether it's like a, a cool down routine after, something to bring you back. Because as soon as you're done your training session, you should try to get parasympathetic again and stay there. And then do things in your off time to, to help you be more more parasympathetic. There's some cool uh, breath work. Well, you got into the Wim Hof stuff, eh? Yes. Yeah. I did. Big time. I do it. Yeah. I don't know how far I'm doing. I'm curious to ask you about yeah. that too. I pretty much have it still on the day. This one little aspect of it on the daily uh, so my showers now are about, well, sometimes they're longer than I was the hot showers, but usually five minutes hot. And then I just crank it down to that, like freeze yeah. my water is strong, the pressure and it is freezing yeah. and I can do about, it's not even that intense anymore. I could about do about two to three minutes. Yeah. And as I'm doing that, I just do the deep, like, right. And I just slow and steady. I usually yeah. get dizzy about, you know, 20 yeah. breaths in. But once you pass the dizziness, it's yeah. like I keep going. And then the yeah. shower is bearable. Yeah. And then when I get out, man, oh, it's better than five cups of coffee. I'm man, just, it's, I'm and back. And the mood. Like my mood is so good after a cold shower. Like, mm-hmm. I, yeah, it's it's awesome. So you're still on the cold showers? Yeah. How often? Yeah. Yeah, usually every day. Like, I, I'll crank. Same thing. I'll like out my yeah. warm shower, do my thing, and then crank it. And I just love that when it hits you. And your body wants to just go <clears throat> like that, but you just, yeah. if you can just keep your, keep your breathing normal. And it's the same thing like your wrist, you know, like you feel like you, you can't breathe right, yes. but you can. It's, it's, you can. It's, it's all the there, breathing. Yeah. Well, it must be like a, like an on on nervous system thing yeah. where that's what I found the trick to it. What made it so much easier is like, you want to go like, <gasps> yeah. and clean shit everything, yeah. but you're just like, <sighs> You breathe and you breathe deep yeah. and you're like, oh, it's not too tough to do this. Like, I, I yeah. love it. Like, I'm going, I go in rivers. Hey, I'm not doing it like crazy hard right. all the time, but I'll see a river there. I'm on a hike and I'm like, oh, I'll go, I'm going to go jump in. People cool. are like, you're nuts. It's May right now. Like, yeah, you know? I just went swimming you're yesterday. Gonna go, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, <laughs> you're right. going to go swimming right now? It's nuts. I'm like, yeah, it'll be fun, you know? Totally. Push the mind, you know? Yeah. So that's a super cool, but more so than the Wim Hof is, I'm really loving is the vagal breathing that Aaron taught me yeah. recently. It's just so simple. It's just monks train me in a different kind of way which i've been doing for a long time but i like this vagal better is just a slow inhale through the nose and then the like a ha like you're fogging up the glass okay. out of the mouth yeah, wherever right. however you want to sit there's no like yeah. crazy you have to be in meditation pose you kind of i sit in meditation pose because yeah. i find sitting on the ground relaxing yeah but wow the difference it just puts me yeah. into that parasympathetic like i come out of it i'm like oh okay how was I not here all day? Right. You know, how, how yeah. was I going through the rest of my day not in this lower state? Like yeah. I did it before I came here and you know, there was a lot of my mind, work's going and yeah. I got family at home, stuff's busy and I, I'm going to do a podcast and it's just like, I'm going to go do that breathing right now and I mm-hmm. finish the breathing I'm like, oh yeah, this is going to be fun. That's that's, this, cool. that's what this yeah. is about, you know what I mean? So totally. do you still work with the breath work or anything? you have any specific training you're doing in yeah. regards to that? Yeah, I've been doing, so um, they do a lot of that in the FRC stuff. Um, What's FRC? That's the functional range conditioning stuff, like the range conditioning stuff. Okay. But so training like diaphragmatic breathing, and similar to because you know how the like Wim Hof he said you know nose mouth whatever like and fully in and let go so like you're like full kind of diaphragmatic inhale and then reflexive exhale so that's and, and that's kind of the one side and so they'll do a lot of that like 
you know, a minute of fully in and then reflexive out, fully in, reflexive out. And on your back is good so you can kind of feel and feel your whole rib cage expanding 360. And then fully in and then hold with your, your diaphragm in a contracted, um, mm -hmm. like contracted state, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you're training that side of your diaphragm and then you let it you hold for like a minute or whatever you can. And then fully out and then reflexive in. So fully out, so you'd like try to blow out a candle like across the room kind of thing, like mm -hmm. really kind of get it up there and then reflexive in and fully out, reflexive in and then fully out again and then you hold for another minute and you just feel like you're gonna die. Like, and for something about breathing out like that and then yeah. trying to hold, you know? And um, so kind of training both sides, your like training your, your diaphragm like a muscle, because it is a muscle, you know? And uh, it's, it's cool. And then I just recently did a like an online course. You ever heard of Brian McKenzie? He mm -hmm. did. He was the guy from CrossFit Endurance. Okay. Super cool thinker, like kind of outside the box guy. And he's been uh, working with Laird Hamilton. You know that guy, the no. big wave surfer dude. And he's got a got a group called XPT Life. Okay. And uh, so doing, yeah, they call it the art of breath. And um, so touches on a lot of the Wim Hof stuff, like. The Wim Hof stuff is really sympathetic, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's really kind of... Uh, it's ma it's mimicking almost hyperventilation, is yeah, it man. not? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I imagine there's a biological function for hyperventilating. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you're going, you're going deep, like, it's, it's, a real, it's a real kind of shock to the system. So yeah, they talk a lot about just nasal breathing in general, like, and uh, there's a book I just read called The Oxygen Advantage that I recommend, man, you'd like it a lot. Yeah, that's, that's you that one. No, I haven't read that, but I was just even thinking about stuff we've talked about or we were talking about before the podcast and just it, that those exact words, the advantage I have where I can feel in jiu-jitsu yeah. or I can feel while I'm doing yoga or right. I feel in my day where I'm like, I'm breathing way slower than you. And if I know you're yeah. <laughs> yeah. through your throat and I'm on top of you in jiu-jitsu, totally. I know you're done soon. Like yeah. I can, you're not going to outlast me. You know? yeah. So there's an insane advantage to that. For sure. And even the Wim Hof breathing, like... I, I play with it now. So I'll do it in the shower for two minutes while I'm in the mm -hmm. cold shower and then I'll get out my phone and I'll fully exhale and hit start on my timer. Mm -hmm. And I'm like clearing two minutes, 15, yeah. two and a half minutes has been like my kind of maxing yeah. out. But like for two and a half minutes of holding a breath, yeah. like it is, there's got to be an advantage to that. But Man. what's this book entail? Oh yeah. So he, um, <clears throat> he's a doc from uh, Ireland. And so his, his big thing is that we over breathe. So we, when, you're, when your breath rate is too rapid, <clears throat> you're taking in too much oxygen. And so you're, the, the urge to breathe comes from not a lack of oxygen in your body, but it's a buildup of carbon dioxide. So you've got receptors, chemoreceptors they call them, that sense how much carbon dioxide is in your, in your um, bloodstream. And when you're breathing too much, you're blowing off too much carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so they become very sensitive to any carbon dioxide buildup. So it's almost kind of a feedback loop. So when you breathe fast, mm -hmm. you, you kind of train your system to always breathe fast. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you can't tolerate much carbon dioxide buildup. But the catch to that is, at the tissue level, carbon dioxide is required to allow hemoglobin to release oxygen. So if, you're, if you can have a, a greater CO2 tolerance, you're, you, you're more efficient at releasing oxygen at the tissue level. So you're, you, you perform better. Like, just like you said in jets, like when you're, when you're breathing slow and you can, you can kind of handle kind of being out of breath and, and hypoxic, you know, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're more efficient. And like the, a lot of the research came from free divers and they're, they have a, like, he calls it the bolt test where you're, you get yourself seated for like, you know, 10 minutes. So you're, you're relaxed. You're, and then you take three slow breaths. And after your last breath, you know, out your nose, you breathe out all your air and you just plug your nose and hold your breath. And so you're not, not like willpower holding it where you like your diaphragm spasming and you're like, you're holding it, but mm -hmm. you just hold it and you pay attention to when you have the strong urge to breathe. Mm -hmm. And if it's anywhere under 20 seconds, it's a low, you've got a low um, tolerance to CO2. And so like you can train upwards of 40 is, is uh, like, there's a huge kind of performance advantage to be had at, at training your, your body to tolerate more CO2. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just that, slowing the breathing down. And there's some protocols where like, kind of running, you can, you can run, do three breaths. After your last breath, you hold your breath, go as many steps as you can with your holding your breath. And then, you know, when you can't anymore, you start breathing again, three breaths again, and you do three seconds, or sorry, three minute cycles of that. Mm -hmm. And it kind of simulates altitude training. So you're, oh, yeah, like hypoxic stuff. And, and 
that seems to be the best gateway to to like tap it into your nervous system because you're breathing when you're not thinking about your breathing you're breathing but as soon as you think about your breathing, it feels like you're breathing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It feels like you're you're consciously. So it has like autonomic and somatic control. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. the two branches of your nervous system. So it seems to kind of be a bridge between that those autonomic functions and uh, mm-hmm. and and your your conscious control of your your body. Eh? That's so cool. It's super cool. Right? It's, and that's what like in all my studies of yoga and all that philosophy and, and meditation. Yeah. Some, Pretty much, it all just comes down to the breath. Yeah, dude. Like the oxygen intake into your body, and yeah. even and you know, once again, a lot of people you say, "Oh, you learned it from yoga or whatever." People kind of, some people might be like, "Oh, but voodoo science." But yeah. my dad's a diver, and when I took a diving course, it was pretty quick. They gave me the crash course because I just wanted to get out there in the right. ocean with my dad. So they're yeah, like yeah. not giving me the full gamut of what what yeah. I was supposed to. They kind of rushed me through it. Yeah, but. Uh, Mexican diving will do that, <laughs> but uh, he was teaching me like the effects of of oxygen versus NO two in the brain and carbon dioxide, yeah. the, the the levels and what it has to your body, like yeah. and, and the effects it has on your cognition and like it's it's interesting, like high levels of oxygen can you be aware, you know, too much NO two like nitrous oxide right. and you start you know you feel drunk or yeah. like half sleepy and you fall asleep, so yeah, there's definitely back science to it with the effects of the oxygen yeah and divers are dialed right in because they have to be it's insane what someone have you ever seen the david blaine where he does the 18 minutes yeah. on oprah it's like crazy. and he talks about kind of training like that just holding it for a minute yeah. without stress yeah and then you breathe out one and yeah. back in for a minute hold it like yeah. i don't know if there's any trickery to that or not or if he just really went for it and trained know, but it seems like that yeah, was, and then wim hoff's done some crazy crazy stuff like yeah that. his like, feats are pretty amazing incredible yeah He's got a long, like decades long history as a yogi too though. Yes. Yeah. Which he doesn't talk no, about. No, he doesn't talk about he that. He does not talk no. about that. And you kind of pick up on it because you know the language and the wording, but he yeah. was a big Kundalini yoga practitioner with yeah. like the breath of fire and yeah. and all those kind of tactics that he pretty much mastered. And yeah. I think he probably had some high level training. He certainly did. And it's yeah. kind of it's cool too back to the, in the jiu-jitsu world like hickson was doing that yeah i don't ever seen choke but I have. like yeah i want to sure, do man. it i just i don't know I, I get i get for lack of better words embarrassed and stuff like that but yeah holy man when i breath i almost want to go and do that before matches because if i know i can hold my breath for two and a half minutes by doing the breath of fire yeah. like i almost want to do that during matches you know yeah. what i mean to, to kind of pump up my breath i know his son crone says he does do that like yeah. he's fine he's weakening he'll start being like <laughs> and people yeah. think oh he's running but no he's just power oxygenating yeah. his blood right yeah, to, yeah. to reuptake so that's super cool man and it, it affects you so much psychologically too like mm-hmm. the like your ability to, to be hypoxic like to kind of live there you know like what what's your what's your self-talk like when you're you know at the at, in a hard workout or you know you got a 200 pound dude sitting on your chest and you can't breathe like if you if you can get comfortable with that, mm-hmm. there's again a lot of performance. Kind That's of what I've been trying. I've been playing a lot with lately is in the sauna. So I'll go stand. I'll stay in the sauna as long as I can. Yeah. And when my brain's like kind of screaming to get out, and then I'll kind of stand there, because oftentimes in a jiu-jitsu match you'll stand back up to wrestle and you'll be gassed out, right? right. You'll just be like, oh, this is a nightmare. I want to quit, and all that negative self-talk just starts. Oh, this is yeah. terrible. This I hate this. You know, this is exhausting. Yeah. So I'll put myself in that state, like in the sauna, where my heart is pumping, yeah. and I'm breathing hard. And I'm just like, okay, get used to this. Make this your home, because if you can make that your home, you know what I mean? Yeah. Your brain's going, okay, like it's just, it's just stress. You can get out at any time so, you want, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And then that's uh, that's something that I think is cool that. There's kind of a resurgence of that kind of training or that kind of like the Wim Hof stuff and the um, exposing yourself voluntarily to that kind of stress. Mm-hmm. It, it, it makes the other stress of life seem so much more manageable. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like when you, when you can like jump into a cold bath or something like that or in a cold shower and keep your breathing cool. Like, and and uh, like that's, that's what stress is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think... It just that's because that's what that's what kept us alive for how many countless millennia, like our ability to to withstand like real physical stress, you know, mm-hmm. and and kind of voluntarily putting yourself there. There's there's really something. Yeah, I, I, I see that with a lot of people, and not to sound judgmental, it will sound judgmental, but a lot of people have gotten soft 
Yeah. It's their ability to endure uncomfortable sure. situations. Like back to the meditation. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've been an advocator of meditation for a long time. Yeah. You'll hear with people about yoga and or meditation. It's like, I hate it. I hate meditation. Yeah. I hate yoga. Like oh, two yeah. minutes in and like, I'm like, why the frick am I here? Like, I want out of here. This sucks. Yeah. This is stupid. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's the hard part right there. Yeah. Your brain's screaming at you. Get out of here. Yeah. Learn how to tell your brain. No, no, no. We, we told ourselves we're coming to a class. Yeah. We told ourselves we're going to do 30 minutes of meditation. Yeah. I'm going to sit here. And yeah. then after 15, when like we talked about earlier, yeah. you, all right, you let go. Then you see the gifts and sure. the rewards coming. So that's, that's it. Yeah. yeah they, when people say, yeah, when someone says, I can't, I just can't, I can't sit, sit in a quiet room alone. Like that seems crazy to me. Like you, yes. that's what you can't do. You can't sit with yourself. You know what I yes. mean? Like if, and if, if you're telling yourself you can't do that, you're really shortchanging yourself on, on what you actually can, can do because I mean, that's uh yeah. Well, bringing it back to a float, like, that's where I see yours place is such a blessing. It's like, give yourself that 90 minutes mm -hmm. where you can go yeah. and be some fully, no, no stress in the body, yeah. no tension anywhere. You got a shower there. You got yeah. like a place to yourself. Give yourself that 90 minutes just to get away. Yeah. Just to like let everything go. And just making the intention, like there seems to be a lot of um, value to that. Just the decision to do it and, and sit there for 90 minutes. You know what I mean? You're, you're giving yourself that window. It's like when you create a habit, like whatever you want to start doing, if you make it easy for it to happen, you'll mm -hmm. do it more. You know what I mean? So like you're kind of opening the window for yourself to, to relax. You're almost giving yourself permission to relax. Yes, which exactly. Is, which is big, man. And that's, and, and yeah, people will say that too. Like, and this, the resistance I feel to it, Every time I get in there, man, like it's the same, it's the same thing. My, my brain. You get that as well? You, oh, after all sure. this time, like when yeah. you go in there, you're like, oh, okay, I got to do 90 minutes here kind well, of thing or? More like I know, like I know it's going to go. I know it's going to, it's going to fade, but the brain, you know, the monkey mind is still, yeah. is still just. There's other stuff I could be doing right now. Yeah. Like laundry, I got these yeah. bills piled up. And so I know I got to just sit with it. I got to just, just let it be, you know, and, and it'll, it'll, uh, it'll go. But that resistance is, is always there. So it's, that's the why the doing it often it has so much value because you, you got to keep coming back like there's I don't think I don't know man maybe some people make it to that spot where they're just there forever mm -hmm. but I don't know I no. feel like it's work man it's always it's work it's definite work and yeah. that's like what we were talking about with like bef way back before in the start was like it's at work work's only going to give real yeah. benefits right like totally. you're, everyone I feel like is looking for that quick fix solution you know what I mean yeah. and it's, it's, it's sad I think it's real sad mm -hmm. how much people go to have been for lack of better words, conditioned to think, oh, you know, you have stress, you take this, you yeah. know, you have anxiety, you do this, right. you know, you go take, you get on this prescription or that yeah. prescription. It's like, whatever happened to doing work, you know what I mean? Yeah. And getting over that stuff, you know, totally. with trying, like, don't get me wrong, there's some cases where people yeah. need certain medications, right, to deal oh, with stuff, sure. but yeah. I just feel like that's a real lack of, of work for it these days. Yeah. So, how much are you floating? Mm. I shoot for once a week. Mm -hmm. Once a week is my is my optimum. It nice. needs to be like once every two weeks. Sometimes once every three. It's like, yeah, it's tough with the job. And I tend to whenever I can, I'll go home and put little man to bed. You know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll tend mm -hmm. to spend spend time with him instead of floating. But once a week is great for me. Like it's a, it's a nice kind of. But uh, it's same thing. Once every two weeks is still great. You know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but um, oh, and I've been doing the Wim Hof stuff, breathing in the tank, mm -hmm. and man. The, the visual, the visuals, when I do that, it's the same thing every time, like first round, first round of the hyper oxygenation, and then into the first breath hold, I just get this like big purple circle right here. Really? And like first round it's there and it's getting more clear, more clear. And then as soon as I take a breath, it kind of, it starts to go away. Like by the fourth round, it's like the, it's like DMT visuals, man. It's really it's yeah. profound in there, dude. Yeah. And I talk, there's another dude who floats a lot. He's into the Wim Hof stuff too. And, uh, and he, he came out one time and, and told me that he, he does it. And we started talking about like, and it's kind of the same thing. Like it's, just, it's right here. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's what is super, like the floating, even I was so proud of you guys when you opened it. Cause I was like, oh, it's amazing. Cause I I'd known about it forever. Like yeah. I remember when I was in grade seven, my buddy and I had a, 
friend of a friend whose dad was a big time bodybuilder okay. and he was a super alternative thinker and he yeah. built his own tank oh, no way. and we always wanted to go see it because he had like worked on it forever and we had heard about it I remember the Simpsons had an episode yeah. about it or like yeah. Lisa and Homer go and do it yeah. and like they have visuals and everyone's talking like about the visuals so when I went my first time I was like I wonder what this is going to be like am I going to see some and I didn't even care that I did because I walked out of there with yeah. just this bliss that was just yeah. stayed with me for like I said two to three days which was way better than any visual that could have but do people report that off have you heard people say like I saw things like I went into I saw kaleidoscope stuff or is that a common thing or is that was yeah. kind of something that was kind of a little bit in the pop culture lore that people kind of passed around yeah that one is like because I heard it too like before I floated the first time I heard all those those stories and, and the, the potential for it. Mm -hmm. And I think I kind of like, um, I, I had it built up too much and then I'm yes. waiting for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And my first float was incredible. We, Tracy and I went down to Minneapolis to try it and uh, it was awesome. Like it, And then for like a, a week after, I had that feeling of like a regular meditation, like just that ease yes. to life. You know what I mean? And I, I just knew that it was something, something I wanted to do. And then the second time we floated was in our place so like as soon like on the drive home from Minneapolis we started talking about like we're doing this and nice. uh, so we just started <clears throat> putting it together but my third float I was like oh okay I, I get it do you know what I mean like or I don't get it but I it's I felt it I felt it like I, I got there and it's it's a lot less fireworks and a lot more kind of a loosening of the your sense of kind of self you know what I mean like the your sense of like um uh yeah, it's hard to explain man like and everybody who comes out and tries to explain their experience the same thing but i'll have, a, I'll have sensations of like you know like a like a bit like a drop of water roll down on my skin or something and it feels like it's not happening to me it's just happening if mm -hmm. that makes any sense you know what i mean like mm -hmm. yeah you know it's attached to it I've, yeah. I've experienced that That's with like it. meditation at the temple. Like yeah. they, they told me like when a fly lands on you, yeah. you don't flick that fly off. It's nuts. And it, sometimes it drives you crazy because yeah. you know like this temple is nuts. Like we'd have to do two hour sets right. like daily. Yeah, yeah. And this fly flies and you're like, oh man, I got to yeah. flick this thing off. It's tickling the hell out of me. But after prolonged meditation, after yeah. a while, it's just like you, you feel it. And you're like, okay, yeah. it's there. And you have a choice. Like you can, you can sit there and think about that fly, and, and it's that that sensation will get so intense that like it's, it's gonna, you're gonna die if you don't flick that <laughs> yeah. thing off. You know, and then when you kind of let go of, of wanting to flick that thing off, or just it's just there now. It's there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's a, you know, I love the process too. And that's <clears> what like I want to articulate with this podcast because it's just I, once again I was so pumped for you guys when you did it because me and my buddy were actually talking about it at the exact same time no way you guys were doing it we're like because we were rated like so curious about the float tank yeah. and I had been doing sweat lodges which are kind of similar sensory yeah. deprivation with the lights and yeah. it kind of adds heat so it's a little bit different but uh well very you know similar qualities essentially yeah. but uh we were talking about just getting one for ourselves and trying it cool. and then you know and then all of a sudden we heard you guys were open so we're like ah scrap that <laughs> idea you know what i mean people yeah. jump people beat us you know oh, yeah. and then we were so pumped to try it with you guys cool, but it's so cool for the city to see people like what was that process for you guys like you and tracy like driving home being like let's do this let's open a business like you know you had your i don't know what you were doing at the time training or no, you i was at the paramedic thing and paramedic. tracy was working at the at rbc yeah, and it's just yeah, boom. And and it, like it seems like overnight the place opened up, but it's never like like that. For I know even yeah, starting yeah. a podcast like this is small. Yeah, and there's so many moving parts to it. So many little things you got to be working yeah. at daily. Like, what was it like the experience of opening a business in town? Oh, it was fun, man. It yeah, was, yeah. Like my cousin, <clears throat> I got a cousin in Whistler, who uh, he's got a restaurant out there. And, you know, um, he told me he had his first float out there, and he called me. He's like, dude, you got to try this flow thing and, and then he kind of said like that could be a good business for Thunder Bay so it just kind of planted the, the seed you know what I mean mm -hmm. and uh, so then we we drove there just to try it and then right away we started doing it and it just started I got a binder and I, I would just start writing stuff in there like anything any research I did I would start writing and then I would make I would call people like other float center owners and we just start writing and building this binder so it went from being like an idea to like something tangible, tangible you know what yeah. I mean? And it, the, the power of that 
of, of just, then I got this binder and I've got all these people, I got to call people back and, and it just started to build. And then all of a sudden we're looking into financing, we're looking into to a place and then we got a place and then the building of it was just a whirlwind. Like we just went hard, you know, and, nice. and got it. And, and it was, uh, you know, help from all family to, yeah. to get it done. And, and, and then the, the opening of it, um, we had some, we had some setbacks. <laughs> There's always setbacks. Always setbacks. Like, always, man. Like, I didn't get a plumbing permit because I'm an idiot. And <laughs> just a lot like, of water yeah. in the flow tank. Yeah, dude, I, I just like thought, oh, I don't know. Like, we, we could just do it. I thought it's okay if you just do it, you know? Um, and I had an uncle. Like, what do you mean, like, it's okay if you just do it? Like, just plumbing build. in regards to what? Like, you had to add extra plumbing to the building? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, like, we had to pipe in all our showers and, and uh, okay. all the drains and stuff like that, you know? And uh, I had an uncle who was helping helping me, and so like we, you know, put came into the drain and stuff. And he was he was doing it all to code because he was a he was a plumber, mm-hmm. and uh, um, we got it all done. And then my uncle had a uh, he had a heart attack, mm-hmm. and like a quintuple bypass and stuff. And, and so he was you know kind of and the the idea was he was going to like he took pictures of everything. And he knew everybody, so he was gonna just kind of get a get him to sign off on it. You know what I mean? Because it was all all to code or whatever. And so we're ready to open. We were trying to open for Christmas time, and I had everything closed up. We were just putting the shower. We were just getting ready to lay tile, so all the drywall was done and everything. We got a knock on the door. Sorry, my buddy and I were at lunch, and I came back, and our neighbors like, "Hey, man, there's a plumber inspector, real mad. He was banging on the door, and he came in here, and he's coming back in an hour." He said. And so he came in and we were ready to, like, I was thinking we were going to be open in a month. Mm-hmm. And he's like, um, yeah, you, you got all this plumbing. There's no permit. I need you to bust that floor open. I need to see, I need to see all the drains. I need to see every pipe you put in here. So I had to rip open all our walls. Oh, I got a right then and there? And I, well, that night, man, I, oh, I, he left and I man. went to the jackhammer. We broke up all the floor, exposed it all again. And then, so I called the next day. I was like, hey, man, it's all open. Come and check it out. And, uh. So he came and checked it out. He's like, yeah, everything looks good here. Um, I'm going on holidays for Christmas, so I'll be back in a month. Yeah. And so a month, dude. We had to sit there with the walls open. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything, man. I couldn't close it up until until he came back. And uh, so Tracy just kind of got on the social media thing and, and started pumping it up. We started doing like a big like pre-opening sale. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because like it was, we were, we were paying rent on that building and not making any money. So we did a pre-opening sale and uh it saved us like if she hadn't done that like it would have been it was so stressful dude but uh we got through it and then you know he came back we got all closed up and and got it all open the day we opened uh the doctor told us was the day tracy got pregnant no way like talk about (laughs) stress like you know stress kind of draining off and and letting the body do what it's what it's gonna do it yeah so it's been cool man and then so yeah, like our, our little guy was kind of born with that, with the place, you know what I mean? So he's yeah. like a tangible time marker for how long, nice. how long we've been, been at Born it. on the same day as me. Did you know that? No way. Yeah, November 6th. Really? I think I, I don't know why I asked Tracy the last time oh, I saw her. Oh, that's cool, Because like, she was mentioning, oh, Colin's birthday is coming up. I'm like, yeah, oh, it's yeah. his birthday. And she's like, November 6th. I'm like, oh, Definitely. pretty cool. So Definitely. that was kind of like the day you opened was on his, well, no. The it day? was that day, like you knew you were having. Yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's kind of been a part of this process mm-hmm. the whole time. But mm-hmm. you said two things there, and that's what like I want to impart to anyone who's like, looking to open a business is exactly what you said like if you look on the floor there that purple binder yeah. that thing has been like dude it there is if anyone's listening trust me to this there's yeah. a power with putting stuff on paper 100%. grab a binder 100%. with a full pad of paper in there and it, whatever it is you're passionate about and yeah. it just the ideas it's so yeah. fun like I, i'm sure you experience that too you're like yeah. You're researching it. You're like writing. Oh, I want to yeah. do this now. Oh, I want the lights to look like this. Totally. I want the decor to look like this. Yeah. And it makes it so much imaginative and fun versus like thinking about it. And then being like, ah, oh, life is busy. Ah, right. that was a cool idea, but whatever. But when you put it to paper, yeah, man. there's like such a different level of accountability. Do you notice and that? And you make it real. And yes. Like, and just that, like you're imagining in your head, like, and, and when, when we, We'd found that place, but we didn't have it yet. That the, our our location on Bay Algoma, mm-hmm. and I used to just drive there and park across the road and just you know drink coffee, and just stare at it, and just like you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And and it yeah. Shit oh, so to you happen. just like kind of like 
projected that into your reality of just like wanting to be in that area? I just like, I, yeah, yeah. My mom found it. She went to Global Experience when it was global mm-hmm. and, and they were having a big going on a business sale or closing, closing yeah. sale, not going on a business. But, um, and uh, she called me because we were looking for a place. She's like, these guys are, this place is coming open. So mm-hmm. I called and it ended up being Aldo Roberto who owns the place. And uh, so the next day we went and had a meeting with him at the Bean Fiend. Mm-hmm. And he's such a cool guy, man. Like he's, so cool. I'm working. He's out of. He's in Africa right now. Yeah. He's 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 slated to be on. Oh it. good. I cannot wait. Dude, to have he's him like on we talked for three hours, man. Once I once we told him about like what we were doing, he's yeah. getting all excited. He's like, you need a name. You need a name. I said, well, we got a name. It's a float. Ah, float. No, it's something better. You need like what is it? Like flotation. Flotation nation. He's going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, he's yeah. so enthusiastic. So yeah, that was just like the perfect the perfect meeting and stuff, but. Um, you know, we were still waiting on financing to be able to pull the trigger, mm-hmm. but yeah, I would just sit there looking at it and imagining like, you know, what it's going to look like and stuff. And yeah, the binder thing, man, you got to make it real mm-hmm. and, and calling people too. I would just call, I, like, you know, look for different float centers online and just call them. Yeah. And it was amazing how many people talked to me, man, and told yes. me whatever, like yeah. just open up their whole experience of, and I, I'm pretty sure it's like that for anything. Like mm-hmm. maybe if they're in town and it's going to be, you're going to be direct competition, maybe not. Yeah. But call someone in Calgary, man. Call someone mm-hmm. in, like just call someone who's doing the same thing you're, you want to do. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. Yeah, we learned about that today. They had a motivational speaker at our school, yeah. and they taught about the concept. I'm, I'm going to call it something different that I learned it as, but the beginner's mind. Yeah. Like, when you approach something as an yeah. open canvas to learning, mm-hmm. people just love filling it up. Yeah. Like it's like it's like anything. Like, play a game of poker, and you've never played poker before, and you're yeah. like, I don't know what to do here. Yeah. People help you. They help you win. Mm-hmm. Usually, the beginner, like they say, beginner's luck. Yeah. It's not luck. No. It's that person is receptive That's right. to all that feedback energy, yeah. to all those input that they're saying. And totally. Like, I played a football pool two years ago, and I picked, I, I don't even watch football, and I picked the two teams in the Super Bowl. No like, way. Just from listening, I'm like, oh, what do you think? What do you think? I don't know what anything about this, and yeah. I just listened to everybody. And I was like, okay. And I'm you like, got no emotional attachment to No, some exactly. Some like people, that. you know, yeah. they're skewed because they've watched all those games, yeah. and like, I don't know, they kind of did yeah. crappy on the back end or whatever. Um, so, yeah, but and another big thing that you touched on too, I think, with people who are going forward in business is. Don't let the setbacks push you back because it happens yeah, with every business. Like oh, yeah, it's cr- nothing's gonna ever just go smooth from A no. to B, right? No. There's gonna be humongous and even For learning sure. in this podcast. That's yeah. what you know. I research podcasts and all these different guys yeah. who are doing podcasts. And I don't know if you ever heard of London Real. Oh yeah, uh, but that's what yeah, that guy yeah. said. He has a whole show on how to make a podcast, and he's like. Get ready for setbacks. He's like, my studio, you know, and we had the same thing. We had a little yeah. backup of time here with the yeah. studio. All this kind of stuff happens and just keep yeah. going forward. Yeah. It's almost two step forward with any business, one step back. Yeah. Two step forward, one back. Yeah. But you're always making progress. Yeah. So. And, and you're, you're storing up, like your effort is stored. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you, even if it feels like you're, nothing's going on, it, you just, if you keep, keep going, you're storing up that effort and mm-hmm. you're, you're going to be able to make a uh, withdrawal after like you're putting a deposit in the banks and you got to just keep doing it mm-hmm. yeah you only feel that's, like that's you something can. i uh, thought was so cool about having you on here is, is like you guys open something that it's not very common at yeah. all in most maybe there's one in most cities but like yeah. you made this dream your reality and that's what yeah. like i want to part with people in thunder bay and i think a lot more people are doing that ever than before now is yeah seeing things online, seeing things on social media and being yeah. like, oh wow, it's doable now. Like, you know, like there used to be this kind of culture, like business is tough, you know, there's yeah. all the players in town already with whatever business it is, you know, yeah. it's, it was kind of unattainable, but now you see all these little startups yeah, man, starting it's, everywhere. It's super interesting times. And the reason I was so excited when I heard you were doing this mm-hmm. is because like podcasts are, are why a float exists, man. Like hearing, mm-hmm. hearing about floating on Joe Rogan and stuff and then, and not only hearing about floating, but just the the listening to people who've done cool things that I admire, mm-hmm. hearing them just talk casually and, and kind of talk about the experiences and, and the, the habits or systems or whatever that they've they've used to kind of get there. Mm-hmm. There's so much more power that has so much more resonance for me than reading a book. Like it had they sat down and wrote something formally. Like mm-hmm. this this kind of this kind of interaction mm-hmm. is is cool, man. And and yeah, Thunder Bay needs it, dude, because there's a lot of cool people doing cool things, mm-hmm. and it's cool that you're going to get to... Get yeah, to... The, the city's getting a lot... I don't know. I saw the city getting a ton of flack. 
for everything yeah. lately and it's it's all what you choose to focus on right. but I don't know negatives seems yeah. to get is a little more tangible for a sensational sure. right where for it gets sure. traction and there is a lot of a lot of garbage happening in our city right now but there's yeah. also a lot of good yeah it's what we choose to focus on I find yeah. and and there's so much good because um, yeah you can't delay you can't delay feeling good about your life you can't wait for everything to be perfect you know what i mean like for all that garbage to not be there to feel good about living here like you got there's cool stuff going on if you you gotta focus on that Mm -hmm. like the like that wake the giant sticker out there you know what i mean on the front of on the front of this building like that's a cool thing you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it like when when i heard about that program that's a what is that is that is that the wakeboarding event or is that something different no so it's it's uh for indigenous kids who come from up north to go to school here okay the Businesses put the Wake the Giant sticker in their window, okay. and it just means it's a safe place, man. If you want to come, if you're scared or, or not, yeah, if you if you need anything, like you're welcome here. You know what I mean? Really? To come here. So, and they all know. So when they come down here, they know that that what that sticker means. And then when they're driving around the city and they see all those stickers, they're like, okay, hey, this is their, there's 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 I'm allies here. out here. Yeah, right? yeah, there's man. people on my side. Yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. and it's. It's so simple, you know? It's such a simple idea, but it's got such a, I think it's, it's awesome. Nice, man. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like we hit everything. I want to leave this on a pause and know cool, what we're going yeah, to yeah. the city, but man, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, I'm buddy. sure we'll probably do it again. Yeah, I'd love to, I, I love, love chatting with you, man. Yeah, so, thanks, cool. buddy. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on.